Welcome to Burton's Media Group's Corona Game Development Step-by-Step -step Series. This is part two of the series. Uh, due to the length of material, I thought it would be best to break this into multiple parts. In this first part, we're going to look at how to handle asteroids and the movement. As I mentioned in part one, this is the video version of an online documentation of how to do game development on the Corona website. If you go to docs.coronalabs.com forward slash guide forward slash programming forward slash 03, this is part of the step-by-step -step guide. So picking up where we left off, last time we loaded our background, we loaded our ship, set up everything to load the asteroids and all the pieces from our sprite sheet. And we also took care of setting up lives and score so that they display on the screen in their own display group. So let's go ahead and get started in creating our asteroids and loading them to the screen. As you might remember previously, everything is currently stored inside of a sprite sheet. We have three asteroids that can be called up and included in our game very easily. Since we have already predefined in main.lua the sprite options, which loads all of our sprites, we can easily load our asteroids in. Now since asteroids are going to be occurring throughout the game, we need to do this as a function so that it can be called as part of the game loop function. So let's create our function for loading asteroids. The first thing we need to do in this function is load the asteroid from the sprite sheet. We've got the variable new asteroid, and this is just a temporary variable that will only be in existence during the this function, the create asteroid function. We're going to display load the new asteroid. We're going to load our asteroid using the new image rectangle. The new image rectangle will load it from the object sheet and go ahead and assign it to the correct size, which is 102 pixels in width, 85 pixels in height. We are associating this with the main display group, and of course we're loading it from the object sheet, and it is object one. So what we've told Corona to do is to load this sprite object into memory and temporarily store that as new asteroid one. Now that loads the asteroid into memory and would actually, um, now we need to tell it to add it to our table. We need to add it as a physics body so that we can interact with it, give it a name and its placement location. Now this loads the asteroid into our table. We're able to reference it easily later on, be able to clear it from memory, and be able to iterate through the table during cleanup and make sure all of them are removed from memory so that we don't have any problems later on. Now we need to add the asteroid to the physics table so that it can be interacted with. This will allow us to do collisions management very easily. So now the asteroid is part of the physics engine. It has been added, it is now a dynamic object, so it'll have full impact um, it'll be affected by the other objects inside the environment. We did set up a physics body around the asteroid with a radius of 40, so it'll be a circle around the actual object for collision detection. And we went ahead and set a bounce at 0.8. If you're not happy with how bouncy or the asteroids are not bouncy enough when they collide with each other, then you can go ahead and adjust the, that value up or down. And we will go ahead and assign, just as we did the ship, we're going to assign the asteroid a name for making collision detection easier later on. And we'll name all of the asteroids, asteroids. Now we're ready to take care of the starting location of the asteroid and where it will be going to. So let's get started by deciding where it's going to be coming from. In theory, to make the game playable, the asteroid should come from the top three quarters of the screen. It could come from the left, the top, or the right. It wouldn't be fair for the player if the asteroid's coming up from behind. There's no way that they could cheat it and get it out of the, the game. So playability-wise, that's probably a bad idea. So we're going to limit 
where the asteroids can originate from, from the left, top, or right. Basically, we are looking at generating a random number between 1 and 3 to determine the direction, with 1 being the left, 2 being the top, 3 being the right. To do that, we'll need to generate our random number. And then we just simply need to know what the random number generated is and determine its direction. Now let's make two important distinctions. With the Lua scripting language, you do use the double equal sign for comparison operations. A single equal sign is used for assignment. Double equal is used for comparisons. And if you are doing, creating an if structure, you have to end the if structure with the keyword end. Unlike Java script or Java, um, where you may be using curly brackets or indentation to determine the end of the structure with the Lua scripting language end the keyword end is used to determine the end of a structure whether that's an if statement a function or a loop for this particular instance in our where from we're checking for the value of one which means it'll be coming from the left side of the screen so we're going to set the starting location of our asteroid its x location at negative 60 so it starts off the side of the screen and then we need to determine where the asteroid is going to be in the y frame. Now remember, in our config.lua, we set a possible height of 1024. So that's the maximum area of the height of the screen. Since we know that that is our maximum, we can then work with the y value and go ahead and just create a random seed for that, or a random number for that. So if we want the top half of the screen, that's going to be approximately um, a random number of 500. Since it's 1024, we could go exactly 512. Or, and if you want more of the screen to be available for it, you could increase this random number. This will generate a number between 1 and 512. So the asteroid will really be able to come from anywhere along the left-hand side down to about halfway down the screen. If you want more, just simply increase that number for a larger percentage. But I think 512 will work very nicely. That'll put it right in the middle of the screen. Now that we have the starting location, we need to determine where's the asteroid moving toward. So we're using the set linear velocity, which allows us to use the physics engine to do a continuous shove or push against the new asteroid object. We are The way we're going to do this is we're giving it two numbers which is what's required for set linear velocity. We're doing this a little more complex because we're actually generating the ra a random number which will determine the direction of the shove or push against the physics object. By giving it math.random, we're going to randomly generate a number between 40 and 120 against the asteroid, which will shove it in the x direction or the horizontal. And then we're going to give it a random number between 20 and 60 in the y direction, which of course is the vertical direction. So this will have the effect of pushing it or shoving it across to the right hand side of the screen in a random location so that we get a little bit more flexibility in how the asteroids behave as they go across the screen. So that takes care of our coming from the left hand side. Let's take care of from the top. This will have the effect of setting our start location anywhere across the top of the game. So our asteroid can come in anywhere across the top based upon the X value. And then Y, we've got it placed somewhere up here above the top of the screen so that it has a start location just off the screen. Now we'll go ahead and, as before, set our linear, linear velocity so that it moves either to the left or to the right. So now our asteroid will move in a random direction coming from the top. Finally, all that's left to do for this particular section is set coming from the right hand side of the screen. If we're coming from the right hand side of the screen, we need to make sure that the asteroid starts 
off the edge of the screen. We can do that with the display.content width plus 60. So that will locate the asteroid somewhere over in this region as it is starting its pro progression across the screen. And we'll, again, as we did with 1, set the Y at a random number between 1 and 512. And finally, we just simply need to set the velocity so that it heads in the direction across the screen, in, in the negative direction for the X value. Okay, so that sets our linear velocity and makes sure that in the X direction we're going to be moving in a negative direction. Remember, we start at 0, 0 in the top left hand corner. The X value goes across an increasing value, so from 0 to whatever our width is, um, 768. So we're going across 0 to 768 in value. If we want to move in a, to the left, we need to decrease the value of x so that it moves to the left. This generates a negative number between negative 120 and negative 40 to push it in the negative x direction and will move it in the right direction for us. So we have just one more thing to add to our create asteroid function and that is to give our asteroid a little bit of spin to make it more visually appealing. So we're going to add a rotation to the asteroid just for fun. So this will apply torque to the asteroid or a twist to the asteroid um, either in a negative direction counterclockwise or a positive direction clockwise just making it more visually appealing otherwise our asteroids would just stream across the screen there would be no rotation to them at all unless there was a collision. This will just make the game a little bit more visually appealing. Now that we have our asteroid added to the game, we're ready to go ahead and get started with firing. So let's go ahead and create the function for our firing the shot. First thing we need to do is, as we did with our asteroids, load the image that will represent our laser. We're going to store this temporarily in the variable new laser. and it will be part of our main user interface group or our main uh, display group. We're loading it from the object sheet. It is the fifth item in the object sheet and it has a size of 14 in width and 40 in length. We do need to make sure that our laser is part of the physics engine. We are adding the laser as a to the physics engine with the add body. However, we're not going to treat this as a true body. This is going to be treated as a sensor. So as the laser shoots up the screen, it's not going to actually physically collide with an object. We're just simply going to detect if there, a collision occurs with an object. When it occurs, it will not create any spin or rotation or any kind of normal collision type thing. We're just simply detecting that a collision did occur so that we can then later remove it from the screen. We're also going to set our new laser to a bullet um, by using the dot is bullet property of new laser which is available to us after we've applied it to the physics engine. We're telling the physics engine that it needs to pay a special close attention to anything that the laser is doing, its movement. It needs to have priority in the processing because it will be moving so quickly on the screen. It needs to pay a special attention for collision situations. Let's give it a name so that we'll be able to detect our collisions more easily. Now we need to place the starting location of the laser. And with this command we've located the laser so that the center of the laser starts at the center of the ship. One last thing, right now the way it would do it is the laser would actually start on top of the ship so it would be good if the laser was behind the ship. So we can use the command to back to send it to the display to the back of this display group. This does not send it all the way back. If you're not using display groups, it would send it behind the, the background. But since we are using display groups, this sends, us, sends it to the back of this particular display group, which is our main group. So now the laser will be behind the ship or any asteroids that are on the screen as it shoots up the screen. Of course, any asteroid that it collides with will be able to take care of in our collisions section. So the last thing we need to do is take care of the movement of our laser. 
and we're going to use the transition to command to handle that just um, there are several different ways we could do it we could also do it with the uh, apply linear velocity but we're going to use transition to just so that we show exposure and how that system works so transition to if you've ever used flash or now adobe animate you've worked with tweening before. Tweening is the process of moving an object from one location to another location and having the computer do all the heavy lifting. With Transition 2 this works very similar to tweening. Tweening or Transition 2 takes the object from where it's currently at and then applies a change to one of its properties over a specified length of time. In this particular case we're telling it to transition the new laser from its current location which is at the center of the ship to above the screen or a location of y equals negative 40 and we want to do this over 500 milliseconds all time inside of the corona SDK is given in milliseconds so this will do this in basically half a second it's going to go from the location of the ship to the top of the screen or above the top of the screen now it'd be nice if the laser automatically cleaned itself up right now if we just simply send a, lasers to the top of the screen when they arrive at that top of the screen they're going to build up if they did not collide with any asteroids. Um, in early versions of testing this game I could produce thousands of shots fired and eventually they would start showing up and build up colliding with each other so that you started seeing them at the top of the screen. That's not how we want to do our game so instead we're going to use an on complete command so that the app is able to automatically remove the shot fired once it reaches the top of the screen. This is called on complete. We're going to add this after our time. Let's go ahead and go down to the next line so it's a little more readable. Now when the laser reaches the top of the screen it has completed its transition and this function will be called. Now this is called a closure. A closure function is a non-named function that just temporarily exists in memory to do a specific function. In this case we're going to create a function that removes our laser from the display, removes it from memory. We never have to worry about it again. We don't have to worry about deleting it from memory or deleting it from the display. It'll just simply be gone. So again a closure using the onComplete command we're able to pass a function or include a function in the creation of this laser so that it will automatically be removed from the screen when it completes or reaches negative 40 in the Y parameters in its transition to from the current location to the top of the screen. Okay so there's just one more thing that we need to add below our function we need to associate a tap at event listener with the firing of the laser. There we go. Now anytime the ship is tapped on the screen it should it will call the fire laser function inside the app. Uh, you might remember from our pre previous tutorials that tap is an event listener. We have all kinds of events that we can listen for. The most common is the tap event listener. This is where the person just quickly touches the object on the screen to cause some type of reaction. And it's normally associated with a button. In this case we're tapping the ship to cause it to fire. So that concludes section A of this tutorial. In the next section we're going to look at moving the ship and our game loop inside the app and then the final section will be handling the collisions of our game. We have a lot more tutorials and lessons forthcoming. If you'd like to follow what's happening, you can follow us on Twitter at Dr. Brian Burton or Facebook at Burton's Media Group or follow us on our website, burtonsmediagroup.com. If you'd like notification through YouTube, hit the like or subscribe button. 